In July 2019, Netflix announced that it would be opening a new production hub at Shepperton Studios in Surrey, Southeast England. This was the latest in a long line of moves to ramp up the streaming service's UK production capabilities. In 2018 and 2019, the company's London office went from employing less than 20 individuals to around 130. And over the course of that same 12 months, more than 25,000 creative professionals were employed in making around 40 Netflix original productions somewhere in the UK. Commenting on this expansion, Netflix's director of public policy, Benjamin King, stated that the UK is a major locus for us in production terms. Globally, it's probably the third most important behind the US and Canada. Continuing that, we are confident there's substantial scope for us to increase our investment in the UK. Of course, Netflix has been making TV shows in the UK for a number of years now. Since 2016, The Crown has been filmed in the UK both on location and at Elstree Studios in Hertfordshire. A great deal of Black Mirror, which moved to Netflix from the British Channel 4 in 2015, has also continued to be filmed in the UK. Nevertheless, as some of the productions which have been the result of the company's more recent expansion efforts have begun to be completed and released, the increase in UK-made Netflix originals available through the platform has been palpable. The show which has stood out as being most exciting to me personally and received the greatest amount of critical acclaim has been the teen comedy slash drama Sex Education. Created by Laurie Nunn and starring Gillian Anderson, Arza Butterfield and Nkuti Gatwa, the show follows Otis Milburn, the son of two sex therapists, as he opens a clandestine sex clinic within his school. The show has a big political statement to make in its foregrounding of the ineptitudes of the sex and relationship education provision presently available to young people. Yet it delivers this thesis in a highly charming way. While, on the one hand, it offers a level of realism often absent in youth dramas in portraying the diverse sex lives of young people in an entirely unmoralizing manner, on the other, it engages a heightened style of dialogue, performance, and editing, which makes the show a real joy to watch. Yet, sex education setting is, to put it in highly academic terms, somewhat odd. For all intents and purposes, the show is set in the UK, or to be more specific, given the accents of most of the cast, though the show is filmed in South Wales, it seems to be set somewhere in England. Nevertheless, on watching the show, one finds things to be not quite so simple. As Ellie Harrison wrote in the Radio Times following the release of the first season, the series is set in a British school, in the British countryside, with a British cast. And yet, oddly, it feels distinctly American. Viewers in the UK might be taken aback, for instance, by the fact that, unlike the vast majority of British schools, the students at Sex Education's Moorfield High don't wear a school uniform. In fact, some even wear US-style letterman jackets with the school's initials emblazoned upon them. The school's hallways, moreover, are lined with lockers in a manner that is pretty uncommon this side of the Atlantic. The school also boasts its own swimming pool, something I've never heard of in a British state school. Beyond the school gates, too, Maeve lives in a caravan park, which in the UK tends, in most, though perhaps not all, instances, to function as holiday resorts rather than as long-term accommodation. And finally, in a manner that's hard to explain, the organisation and topography of Moorfield simply seem to evoke rural America just as much as it does the English countryside. There are likely a whole host of other American influences on the show that we could pick out, and a great deal of time could be spent going through sex education frame by frame, highlighting some of these geographical incongruities. Nevertheless, I think to do so would be to buy into the idea that the show has done something objectively wrong in utilising this aesthetic. As I'll discuss shortly, all of this is intentional, and television shows are simply not required to represent the world accurately, if such a thing is even possible. Yet, while I will defend Sex Education's ability to represent the world in whatever way it sees fit, 
I think it's interesting to consider what this mashing together of English and American culture does to our experience of watching the show. Who it implies it is intended to be watched by, and how it might impact sex education's ability to comment on the state of sex and relationship education in the present day. Before we go any further, a quick reminder that if you're new around here and this seems like your kind of thing, then you can subscribe and hit the notification button to get a little buzz every time I release a new video. And a shout out to Kaya Lan for signing up to the top tier of my Patreon page. If you'd like to join them in getting early access to some of my videos and copies of the scripts to them, then I'd be very, very grateful if you'd check out that page at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. With that out of the way, however, let's crack on with the video. In an interview with Vulture magazine in 2019, Ben Taylor, who is one of Sex Education's two executive producers and the director of numerous individual episodes of the series, suggested that the decision to draw so heavily on American influences in the show's aesthetic was made in order to tip a hat to the work of John Hughes, the writer and director of films such as Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club. He told Vulture that he'd always wanted to do a high school rom-com, a Hughesian style high school experience. That is not something that really exists in the UK. Writing and rendering of the British school experience is not traditionally joyful. And for some, this will be explanation enough for the show's strange setting. It certainly gives rationale for many of sex education's stylistic choices, such as its witty, zinging dialogue, its colour palette, and some of the narrative tropes that it engages with. Yet, yeah, Personally, I think this raises as many questions as it answers. For again, while sex education is under no obligation to accurately represent the world as it actually exists, the show's embrace of the mythology of the American high school, from its visual appearance to its social hierarchy and much more, however enjoyable, makes it hard to conceive of the show as a rendering of the British school experience at all. Some more cynical viewers might argue that drenching the show in the accoutrement of small-town America reveals less a desire to represent the British school experience more joyfully and more an attempt to ensure that the show can appeal to and be understood by an American audience. For, to draw for a moment on a little bit of literary theory, in his 1974 book The Implied Reader, Wolfgang Eiser argued that Although most cultural texts can be read, watched, or viewed by anyone, most have in mind an implied reader. Iser argues that cultural texts, by necessity, assume certain knowledge on the part of the reader, or in this case viewer, and present us with what he calls blanks, which we are required to draw upon our pre-existing knowledge of the world to fill in. The argument here is not that a text might become entirely incomprehensible to anyone who is not this implied reader, but simply that someone who is in possession of the cultural knowledge needed to fill in these blanks will get more out of it than those who don't. And by observing what pre-existing knowledge a text does expect us to have and the knowledge that it feels the need to explain to us, we can identify who the intended audience for that text is. In such a way, one might argue that sex education's many American influences reveal an implied reader, or again, viewer, who has been through, or is currently going through, that very experience. In short, that the show, though watchable and enjoyable by anyone, is constructed primarily with an American audience in mind. Nevertheless, I don't think it's that clear cut. For one could argue that the dominance of American culture, at least in the English-speaking world, if not elsewhere too, has led to the American high school experience establishing itself as a kind of global norm. Partly through the success of the teen comedies of John Hughes and others that have influenced sex education directly, one could argue that although we are very aware of its acute geographical and cultural specificity, 
We have come to view the experience of our American friends as a kind of universal, essential school experience, which those of us elsewhere in the world consider our actual experiences a kind of deviation from. Rather than sex education being specifically targeted at an American audience then, I would argue that the decision to draw so heavily on American influences in the show's aesthetic is more a matter of the show's creators wanting to avoid it ever becoming too British. While the show does draw on aspects of particularly English culture, a certain stuffiness, particularly around matters of sex for example, or the green and pleasant landscape, I would argue that the show evidences a fear of presenting the viewer with too many blanks to draw on Isa's terminology, that an international audience more familiar with the American school system, or at least how that experience has been presented by pre-existing films, television shows, books and other media, might not be able to fill in. To kind of sidebar for a brief moment, this is all notable in relation to the discussion of Netflix's investment in the UK that I opened this video with. For the UK government, like many national and local governments across the world, incentivizes production companies to make TV shows and films within the UK through providing them with tax breaks. And these aren't always huge. In 2018, for instance, Netflix received only £51,000 as a reward for the shows that it produced in the UK. It is worth noting, however, that there are two reasons that governments provide these incentives. The first is simply that making a film or television show involves spending a lot of money. And the amount that a production company spends during filming more often than not counterbalances the cost of the tax incentive while also creating jobs. The second is that having films, television shows and whatever else set in your country or city implies a certain level of importance to what happens there, and is thus deemed good for what Joseph S. Nye Jr. refers to as a country's soft power. A show like The Crown, for instance, might make people from other countries want to visit the UK or to purchase British goods, and in a looser sense, the manner in which it presents the UK as a major player on the global stage reinforces the idea that Britain is a country that you want the government of your own country to be on good geopolitical terms with. The sex education is interesting in this sense. For where the Crown somewhat problematically seeks to assert the UK's soft power through invoking the memory of empire, Sex education serves as something of a record of how diminished the country's soft power is in the present day. Where once it was possible for the UK, through hard military power, to force much of the world to view its culture, or at least that of its ruling class, as being a kind of universal standard, sex education's deference to the cultural ideals of its former colony, America, reveals that with the empire a thing of the past, Britain's ability to present itself as central to global culture is, although not entirely absent, somewhat fading. Nevertheless, even if we view sex education's embrace of American influences as less an attempt to endear the show to an American audience in particular, and more as an effort to appeal to a contemporary notion of universality, this still raises some questions. For at the heart of the show is a pretty weighty political point. A 2016 report by the Terence Higgins Trust, a UK charity which campaigns for better services surrounding sexual health, found that half of young people felt that the sex and relationships education that they received in school to be either poor or terrible. 95% were not taught about LGBT relationships, 75% were not taught about consent, and 89% had experienced sex and relationship education which failed to ever mention the fact that it might be in any way enjoyable. Sex Education the TV show evidently wants to say something about this. Yes, it might also want to provide a joyful representation of school life, but a central part of its thematic fabric is the notion that sex and relationship education, or SRE, as it presently exists in the UK and elsewhere in the world, is not up to scratch. By extension, the show seems to want to make the case that a more inclusive, sex-positive approach to SRE would be beneficial for young people's sexual and mental health. 
The very fact that I'm making this video suggests that, on a very basic level, the show makes this point fairly successfully. Although it occasionally deviates from this, the standard narrative arc of an episode of Sex Education is that, at the opening, one of Moorfield High's students is struggling with an element of their sexual life, and after visiting Otis, or in Season 2, his mother Jean, for advice, they usually end up, if not entirely solving the problem, at least with a deeper understanding of whatever it is they're grappling with. Otis's advice is certainly never perfect. Yet the experiences of the show's characters generally infer that talking about sex and relationships in an open and honest way is a good thing. Towards the close of season two, however, the show begins to tackle the ethical questions intrinsic to a young person with no training other than what he has picked up from listening to his mother's therapy sessions running a sex therapy practice in an abandoned toilet block within his school. And throughout both seasons, we are made aware that this is not the ideal scenario. The existence of Otis's practice, if we can call it that, is a workaround made necessary by how dire the school's official SRE provision is. Nevertheless, the show never makes it particularly clear why the school's SRE provision is so lacking. The show alternates between falling back on notions that this is simply the way things are, and implying that it is a result of the stuffiness and awkwardness of the school's staff. And in doing so, the show somewhat simplifies the challenges that exist here. For while it may be a factor, what is taught in schools regarding sex and relationships is rarely simply a matter of an individual head teacher being a little bit awkward. Instead, it is primarily the result of inadequate policy at the government level. For, as the report I mentioned a moment ago stressed, one of the problems with SRE as it exists in the present day is how variable it is. In some places it might be great, in others entirely non-existent. Oftentimes, decent provision is reliant on voluntary groups like the UK charity Sexpression convincing schools to allow them to work with their young people for a morning or afternoon. And while such groups often embody exemplary practice and represent a far, far better intervention than that provided by Otis's makeshift clinic, this is still obviously not ideal. There is a reason that the Terence Higgins Trust were so jubilant when, in 2018, it was announced that SRE would become compulsory in all UK schools, and that is because necessitating such provision at the national level is pretty much the only way to ensure that it becomes available to everyone. While the antagonism between the diverse sex lives of Moorfield's young people and the awkwardness of Mr. Groff, the head teacher, may make for a fun narrative then, it somewhat elides the complexities of the show's central theme. Even the greater role that Maxine, the chair of the Moorfield High Board of Governors, plays in season two, never quite leads to the show considering these broader questions of what a more lasting solution to the inadequacies of sex and relationships education in contemporary school systems might be. And this leads us back to the issue of sex education setting. For, although the reason that the show doesn't engage more deeply with the matter of why the students of Moorfield High don't have access to better SRE may simply be due to the show's creators not wanting to get their joyful rendering of school life bogged down in the intricacies of government policy, one wonders whether the manner in which the show avoids ever being too specific in its setting would have ever allowed them to. For engaging with such political issues on anything other than a surface level requires an acknowledgement of specificity. It necessitates taking into account how specific policies affect specific people in specific places. Sex education, however, is essentially set nowhere. And this means that, for all the interesting questions it raises about the sex and relationships education provision available to young people in the present day, it is ultimately unable to dig too deep into the question of how this might have come to be and what might be done to rectify it.
Thank you for watching this video. If you've uh, enjoyed it, I'd love it if you think about sharing it with a friend who you think might also like it. And a huge thanks again to Kaya Lan, to Ash, to Michael V. Brown, to Jay Fraser Cartwright, to Sindri Nielsen, and to Army of Me for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here and getting your hands uh, on a copy to the scripts of these videos and quite often early access to these videos, then you can do so by heading over to patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thanks so much for watching once again and have a great week.